So let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here tonight. Uh, for our time together, we are grateful um, for the opportunity to be with you, Lord, as your Holy Spirit opens up your word to us, as he helps us to pray, and as he gives us what we need tonight. And so, Father, we are grateful for your presence here with us. Be with all of those who are watching online, wherever they may be. Bless them, lead them, comfort them, teach them, and give them what they need as well. We thank you, Father, for the miracle of your Holy Spirit, so that wherever we may be, whether here in the room together, or all over this country, around the world, your Holy Spirit can be with us all at the same time, giving us the same word, and we are just amazed and grateful. And so thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, unfortunately, for those of you uh, watching online, you you know, unless you've got cheesecake of your own, you're, you're out of luck, really. <laughs> but we are very grateful to Jill and Jerry, who had a wedding over the weekend, and they're still standing. Well, sitting, really, yeah. yeah. And... Um, the wedding was lovely. Um, everything went all according to plan. With an amazing pastor. With an amazing, yeah, he was all right. He, you know, as long as we didn't drop the rings, we were in good shape. No, you just got them mixed up. That's right. Well, actually, they 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 double clutched on me. The the best man's supposed to have the bride's ring, <clears throat> and the maid of honor's supposed to have the groom's ring. So what and, and, and so, but see, we were flipping everything around anyway, and so it made perfect sense the entire way. So either way, one of them was coming out of there with a ring. With a ring. So tonight we're looking at James chapter 3, the last line of verse 5, which uh, in your notes is listed as uh, part C there, 5C. Uh, and then um, uh, we are uh, also... And then going down to verse 12. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start with uh, the end of verse 5 uh, through verse 6. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set, upon, uh, set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Well, don't you just wish James would just come out and say how, what he feels. Um, the first part that we were looking at there uh, at the beginning of chapter 3 is talking about the power of the tongue uh, and how vitally important it is for Christians to always be mindful, as he says, like a, uh, a horse can be controlled by a small bit in its mouth, so too should we try to control the, the tongue. Um, here he's talking about the effects then of a, a tongue that is out of control. And he says it's, it's, like, a, it's like a forest fire. Um, See how great a forest is set, af set aflame by such a small fire. Um, I remember all of the uh, Smokey the Bear uh, public service announcements when I was a kid. Um, and how, uh, you know, he, he always just had that one little match with him. Because that's all it takes, is that one little bit. Um, and forest fires and wildfires were something that the people of Palestine were just all too familiar with. Um, you know, if, if you're in Hollywood and you're going to shoot a movie about the Middle East, uh, which is the smarter thing to do? Go all the way to the Middle East or just go on a back lot out near Bakersfield? Uh, it all looks the same. Uh, and so, yeah, much like parts of California, in Palestine, the, the dry season sees the grass and the scrub become just dry as tinder. And so a careless flame, no matter how small, can set off just an uncontrollable fire. Uh, and, there's, and there's nothing you can do. I mean, you think about it, with all of our technology and all of, all of the power that we, we think we wield today, 
when a fire sets off in Northern California or Central California, what are they going to do? You know, they're they're just they're just helpless. You know, to to try to keep it back, uh, and uh, so you you match that to to first century Israel. There's there's really not a lot you can do. And in, in the Psalms, in Psalms 83, verses 13 and 14, and in Isaiah uh, 9, uh, 9, 18, the psalmist and the prophet both speak of the tongue as being just a terrible forest fire. Um, this, this uncontrollable, powerful, powerful thing. You see the same thing in Proverbs 16, 27. So they're very aware uh, James is not coming up with something new. It's a common metaphor uh, to understand the, the power of what we say and how it is like just an uncontrollable fire, just set off by the smallest, smallest thing. Um, you know, when I, was, uh, when I was a Boy Scout and we would go camping, um, we got uh, graded very, very closely by our scoutmasters for not just how we started our campfire, but what we did with it at the end. You know, did you not only put it out, but did you bury it? Um, I got to confess that, and, and he wouldn't deny it, that my dad was really bad about stuff like that. Uh, I came home from school one day, and he, uh, he didn't like it that some of the overgrowth from the other side of the fence uh, which was all undeveloped land, uh, was, was coming over, and so he just wanted to burn back just a little of it. And 650 acres later, uh, we, uh, we finally got it out. <clears throat> um, we were at my cousin Barbara's house one time. She had a beautiful place on a lake uh, near Keystone Heights. And uh, he, uh, you know, Dad, Dad enjoyed those kind of family get-togethers, but after about an hour, he would get antsy. He's looking for something to do. And he walks down to the edge of the lake near her dock and says, you know, if you burned off all this scrub around your dock, it'd be a whole lot cleaner. And she said, you leave my scrub alone. You, don't you touch it. And he just couldn't help it. So we're, we're all in there eating pecan pie and talking and catching up, and somebody says, do y'all smell smoke? And there's my dad down by the lake, and it's all burning. The dock is now on fire. Um, and and my, my son was so proud of the fact that he had these brand new, entirely too expensive tennis shoes on the dock because he had gone out there, taken his shoes off, and jumped in the water. Well, now he can't get back up on the dock because the dock's on fire, so he's got to go around, and he looks, and there's his shoes. You know. Um, and uh, dad says, well, I got, got rid of the scrub. Yeah, uh, it's a good thing we were right by a lake. Um, so you see, the, the two big similarities here um, is that like a wildfire, the damage that the tongue can cause is just wide ranging. Um, now stop and think about it. Uh, almost every day in the media, somebody's life is getting ruined by the cancel culture world that the media lives in right now by something that they said decades ago. A comment they made, a statement they made, a speech they gave. Um, I, I saw one where some politician somewhere who you know, had more than a little gray in his hair had their entire campaign thrown off the rails by a paper he wrote in high school. How many of you want to be held accountable for anything you did in high school, you know, uh, let alone a paper that you wrote, which was perfectly fine. Nobody said anything 50 years ago when he wrote it in high school. But today, oh no, you can't, you can't say that. You can't use language like that, words like that. Um, the, the powerful, far-reaching effects of what we say. Um, uh, William Barclay points out that the Jewish rabbis had this picture, that life and death are in the hand of the tongue. Has the tongue really a hand? No. But as the hand kills, so the tongue. The hand kills only at close quarters. The tongue is called an arrow because it kills at a distance. 
An arrow kills at 40 or 50 paces. But the tongue, it is said in Psalm 73, 9, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts or parades through the earth. It ranges over the whole earth and reaches to heaven. Um, their tongues strut, their, their, their tongues parade, their, their tongues show off in front of the whole world uh, you know, to be able to demonstrate their power. Well, you think about it. Uh, a boxer may block a punch. Um, I was watching a clip of an old fight uh, with Muhammad Ali. <clears throat> Uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And, and he would all, whenever he would get with Howard Cosell at the end of the fight, he would always remind Howard that he's prettier than Howard. Well, I'm prettier than Howard. Uh, this is true. Yeah, that wasn't really going a big stretch. But the thing was, it was hard to hit Ali. Uh, it was hard to hit him. Uh, you know, he'd get in there against Joel, Joel Frazier. And, 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 you know, Frazier's working Ali's midsection, but it was hard to hit him in the face. It was hard. He was, you know, he, he, could, he could either use his hands or he was quick with his head and his upper body to, to miss the punches. You might block a punch or a fencer may parry a sword thrust, but there's nothing that can be done to defend against the tongue, even at a great distance or over great stretches of time. Um... It, you know, again, somebody may say something about you, you know, 30 years ago, and you're applying for a job, or you're in the spotlight for some reason, and somebody says, well, you know, back in Timbuktu 30 years ago, somebody said this about you. What do you have to say? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, because it, it, the way that it just is able to reach out and hurt you over great distances and over great stretches of time. Secondly, it's, it's just uncontrollable. It can get you from a distance, it can get you over time, and then it's, it's just, you just can't control it. There's an old saying that says three things uh, come not back. The spent arrow, the spoken word, and the lost opportunity. Um, that's why it's an old saying. It wasn't a spent bullet, it was a spent arrow. Um, <laughs> You know, the spent arrow, you can't get back. The spoken word, you know, once you say it, you, you, can't, you can't get it. Um, you know, I remember when, when you know, my, my, my kids were in college and social media was just percolating. And I said, be careful before you hit that send button. Because <laughs> once you do, you can't get it back. Uh, there's, there's nothing, nothing you can do. And of course, the, uh, the, the lost opportunity. Um, I, I had a moment years ago while we're talking about Martin Luther King where a spoken word, not mine, somebody else's, and a lost opportunity that was mine all came together at the same time. Um, one of the uh, most successful African American magazines in America has been, uh, for decades, has been Jet Magazine. And they, uh, they had a big event at Morehouse College in Atlanta, um, in the chapel there where Dr. King preached when he was a student and, uh, and then many times thereafter. Uh, and I was, I was kind of like being in there. It was kind of, a, kind of neat, just kind of looking around, you know, trying to see the, the ghost, as it were, of, of all the people who had come through there before. And uh, the purpose of it was to try to get... Uh, successful, influential, um, um, African-American uh, business people to commit to um, making a difference in the academic lives of black students in Atlanta. And they had speaker after speaker get up. And, uh, and talk about why this is important and why this is worth your time and your money and your investment. And then something went really sideways. Uh, this one guy got up. He was very famous, was on the radio, now on the internet. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's ubiquitous. He's everywhere. And 
he shot the whole thing down in about five minutes. Just a couple of words here, a couple of words there. Cut the legs out from underneath it the entire way. And because he was who he was, nobody spoke up against him. And the entire, the entire event fell apart because of just a few short words from him. And I'm sitting there realizing what's happening as he's speaking, and I'm going, cut him off. Pull the plug on the mic. Do something. Don't let him keep talking. But he kept right on talking and shot the whole thing to pieces. And I'm sitting there thinking, surely somebody is going to say something. A, a counterpoint, something to get it back on track, and it never did. And then I'm thinking, of everybody in here, I might be the only person here who can pull that off. But I, I, I chickened out. I missed the opportunity. Um, and I've kicked myself so many times for that ever since. Um, I, I had this five second debate in my head about whether that would be a good idea, bad idea, are they going to listen, are they going, you know, uh, am I going to make more enemies and friends doing this, what am I doing, am I doing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm chicken it out. Um, and so often that's what needs to happen though, when you get that spoken word that's just causing that firestorm, and you've got the fire hose, you can put it out. And you don't. You miss the opportunity. One word out there. It's impossible to get it back. And then once it's loose, gosh, it's almost impossible to kill a rumor, isn't it? You know, I mean, how long has uh, President Eisenhower been dead? And they're still saying, <clears throat> You know, did he have an affair with his secretary in London during the war? Those rumors were around in 1943, 44, 45. And still today, people are going, you know, did, did, you know, it's almost impossible to kill a rumor. And an idle word can be as deadly as, as any poison. And, and brothers and sisters, teenagers today, kids today, are literally dying because of the verbal bullying on social media. Um, this, the, the suicide rate, the depression rate, particularly among younger teens, is so high. And it's all about social media. Um, most of you know, some of you know, at least two of you know, that Daniel Hilaire uh, was a school resource officer, an SRO, for a number of years before he had the position that he has with the sheriff's office now. And he and I were talking about this very thing at, at lunch not long ago. And he said if, if he could be king for a day, he would get rid of social media. Uh, because it is such a disastrous thing for these kids. Um, Kathy and I were watching a show the other night, and this, uh, this girl did something, you know, 10th grade girl did something really good at school, and all their friends are on their phones, you know, getting video of it, and somebody uploads it onto Instagram, and boom, off it goes on, on the internet, and it's getting 500 likes, 1,000 likes, 5,000 likes, 10,000 likes. And one person makes a negative comment out of the thousands who saw it. And it puts her in a terrible tailspin. It's amazing, isn't it? You can have 10,000 people say, that was great. But that one negative comment is, is all it takes. And on social media today, gosh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough. You know, one of the key things that should make it obvious, as First John puts it, that we as Christians are different than the rest of the world 
is how we use and control our tongues. You know, John says it should be obvious as to who are followers of Christ and who are not. He's absolutely right. And one of the ways is how we speak to people. Uh, when I'm talking with young adults, uh, I've got my three-legged stool, right, doing premarital counseling. Um, communication, learning how to listen with your heart. Commitment, love burns hot and cold, but the commitment you make before God is bigger than the love you have for each other. And then Christ, Christ. Um, and part B of Christ is finding a church. It is so important for young couples particularly today, to find a church. Because the world out there is going to try to tear your marriage down. Um, the vast majority of people, by the time they're in their 30s, uh, are on their second, maybe third marriage already. Or they've quit already. They're, they're never getting married again. They may date with somebody, they may move in with somebody, but they're never getting married again. And so, you know the, the saying, misery loves company? You know what misery hates? Happiness. Happiness. You know, so you get a new job and you come into the office and, you know, you're, you're just coming back from your honeymoon in Paris with the Eiffel Tower right outside your hotel window. And, uh, and you're on cloud nine. You're just the happiest person in the world, you know. And, and you walk into an office and you say, hi, I'm Susie Sunshine. Hello. We're glad you're here. Your desk is over by the sewer. And they're not going to help you in your marriage. The people you spend Monday through Friday with, eight hours a day, are not only not going to help you with your marriage, they're going to tear down your marriage. Um, I, was, I was having this conversation with a young couple recently. And the bride said, you know what? It's true. I'm thinking, I'm not making this stuff up. Yeah, it's true. She said, I was, I was in an elevator. And this lady looks at me and says, well, you seem perky. And she says, yeah, I'm getting married. And the, the lady looks at her and says, don't. It's a trap. You'll hate it. You'll ruin your life. And she's like, thanks. This is my floor. Have a nice day. You know? <laughs> What church should provide is a safe place for your marriage, a safe place for your family, where you as a wife, you as a husband are built up and not torn down, where your kids are built up and not torn down. Um, I don't brag enough, as, as I, I probably should, on, on the church in Athens where we were. Um, one of the one of the things about that church which I thought was spectacular was the number of children with special needs in that church. Because once word got out that we were a church that was willing and equipped to handle your children with special needs, it was amazing how many people were willing to come. And, and you know, they would come and, and their children would um, uh, not sit still in the worship service. Anybody ever seen a child not sit still in a worship service? Any of you wives have a husband not sit still in a worship service? Yeah. And they're apologizing and they're saying, you know, we won't be back. You know, we don't want to cause a disturbance. No, cause the disturbance. You know, honestly, that's the Sunday sermon, by the way. Um, <clears throat> cause the disturbance. Let your child be, you know, and I'll tell them, look, I did youth ministry for 11 years before I became a pastor. There is nothing your child is going to do that 50 middle schoolers didn't do long before you. Um, you know, it's okay. We want you to be here. Um, and again, rather than saying, well, you know, no, your child is disruptive. Your child is not right or whatever. The, 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 one of the toughest ones we ever had um, was right after, and, and I was still, you know, before I started dyeing my hair this color. <laughs> Uh, it was right after we moved to the church in Atlanta, and um, and a, a family that we had kind of known before showed up, 
and they had a profoundly uh, special needs child. And they said, uh, I said, so where are you guys going to church now? Nowhere. Well, you're here today. Well, yeah, we just wanted to come say hi to you. Okay. Um, why are you not going to church anywhere? No church will take our child. Well, what in the world's wrong with your child? <laughs> and they just said, well, he's just very difficult to handle. He's very difficult to control. And I said, well, how old is he? Six. Six-year-old. So I'm looking at one of the dads over there. I said, is he bigger than him? He said, well, no. I said, okay, all right. Well, let's see if we can get some people in there who will love your child and be able to handle it. You know what we did? We hired somebody. Uh, we, we found a uh, university student who was majoring in special education. And, um, and we, we paid them uh, to be able to come on Sunday mornings and, uh, and be one-on-one -on -one with that little boy. And um, the parents, 30, 40, 30 something years later, are still at that church um, because we made the effort to say something positive, to say hope rather than pain, to say embrace rather than rejection. So much of what we say is going to set and a whole family on a course. And this is exactly what he's talking about here um, in the next section. So when he says that the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, James is suggesting that in our body, our tongues stand for everything that's wrong with the world. Uh, when, he, when he uses the Greek word cosmos, that's a very common word for the world. Um, but like so much of English, the context depends how we understand it. Um, you know, so much of English is context. That's why it's very hard for people for whom English is not their first language. Um, uh, if I say um, I'm, I'm going uh, hunting for deer, or, or if I, I'm saying if I want deer meat, that doesn't mean that I like the meat, you know. Uh, my dear wife and dear meat is not the same thing. Um, you know, it's all the context of how we say it. Well, in the context in which uh, James is using this, uh, it suggests cosmos is, is the world without God, uh, where, where Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Same thing. Uh, it's a world without God. It's a world that's hostile to the very name of God. A world that out of ignorance of the nature of God is host hostile to him and his kingdom. So an uncontrolled tongue is like a world in rebellion against God. Now this, this is where we're, we're talking about how, how it affects just the whole course of your life. There at the end of verse 6. Uh, where it says, and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. Um, literally, because it, it doesn't make as much sense, it makes more sense to say the course of our life, but literally he means the wheel of our life. The ancients saw life as a wheel. Now when you think about a wheel, it's complete, it's round, it's whole. Um, and they saw the wheel as always moving forward and sometimes cyclical. Um, and you, you can well understand because, you know, you, life is very like that. You have winter, you have spring, you have summer, you have fall, and you have winter again. There's a cycle to life. Um, and, but it's constantly moving forward, this forward-moving cyclical wheel that, that sets your course. And again, we, in the world in which you and I live, we don't get it. And you know, the amazing thing is how little the world changed from James's time until the mid 1800s. Because those people that moved out west, how did they get there? Wagons, that's right. And so you gather in St. Joseph, Missouri, and you get together your wagon with the wagon master who's loading up a wagon train. And the last thing they tell you as you're leaving is choose your ruts. Choose your ruts. What are the roads made of? Trick question. There are no roads. You know, but yes. Okay. 
you're you're in you're follow you're putting your wheels in ruts down in the mud down in the dirt um, and and your wheels are locked in there that's why they called it a wagon train because it's like a a train of cars that's how they were all in perfect line behind each other because you're all locked in the same ruts you're all lo- your wheels are locked in there and so <clears throat> The tongue is able to destroy the wheel of your life, the course of your life. Remember one comedian said, you ever go out west and you see those, those uh, uh, driveways that have a mailbox here and a broken wagon wheel there? That's because that's where the wagon broke down and they didn't have another wheel and that's why they called them settlers because once it broke down, they settled. Yeah, this, we'll settle for this. This is good. Um, And so, for good or for evil, a single word can set the course of someone's life. You know, like I said, 30-something years later, that family's still at that church because we spoke Jesus and not evil to them. If we had said, Woo! Boy, that's a tough kid you got there. Good luck. Yeah, um, I, I think I shared a few weeks ago uh, the story of the uh, family um, back in the uh, early 90s when the AIDS epidemic was, was so difficult. Um, the, the dad, the pater familia, had been president of the Southern Baptist Convention, head of the Southern Baptist Radio and TV Commission, he was a big cheese in Southern Baptist life. His son was a youth minister at a church in o- Oklahoma. And he and his wife were going to have their first baby. They were so excited. And so a uh, big baby, little mama, she needed some extra blood. And, but it was the early 90s. And the blood was tainted. And so without anybody realizing it, the hospital gave the mama and the baby the HIV virus. Now, the thing about the HIV virus, it can be in there for a long time, and you don't know that you've got it. And, of course, in those days, there was no reason to think that you've got it. Right. You know, so she feels fine, looks fine, acts fine. They go on. You know, the little boy's two years old. They're getting ready to have another baby. And that baby has it. And so by the time the oldest one turns five, both he and his mama start showing signs of the HIV virus converting to AIDS. And once they get that diagnosis, the church that the father had been you know, serving as youth minister fired him and said, don't ever come back and don't bring your children back. And not only could they not find another church who would hire him, they couldn't even find another church who would let them set foot inside the door. And both of the children and his wife all died within a very short time after that. Um, What do you think the young man's attitude probably was about church after that the one time that i needed my church more than anything else they spoke opposite to me yeah i mentioned sunday the youth group uh, in atlanta young lady in there loved her to death we're still friends on facebook um but boy she was a tough nut to crack uh, when we first got there because her parents had gone through a divorce and no one, not her Sunday school teacher, no one from the church had reached out to her with a word of hope. You know? Um, it, it's this, this little thing we call the tongue. Um, it can either do great good or great damage. Um, and James says... And you want to know what lights that fire? You know, think about how we do our our Christmas Eve service where we've got the one candle and within five minutes we've got hundreds of candles all lit. 
So where does, where does that one little flame come from? The very fires of hell, James says. That's where the flame comes from. Whew. I, I once had a professor come into uh, a, a classroom when we were in seminary. In the final exam, he goes to the board and he writes, of all of the early church fathers, which one would you prefer to be in a small car with driving across country and why? I didn't pick James. Um, who did I pick? I think I picked John. I like John a lot. Um, verse 7. For every species of beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. The, the process of taming the animals is common in the Old Testament. You see it in the creation story in Genesis 1.28 where God tells Adam to rule over the animals of the earth and the Lord reiterates the point to Noah in Genesis 9.2. And then it's celebrated in Psalms chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. Um, yes, we have mastered the animals of, of the world. Um, but James's point is, look, we might have tamed the mighty elephant. And a snake charmer can control his, his serpents. But no one has ever controlled the tiny, yet deadly and powerful human tongue. And he wraps up this portion in verses 9 through 12. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening <coughs> both fresh water and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Well, here James is talking about humanity's split nature. You know, where you've got the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the, the other. And nowhere, James is suggesting, is this more evident than the human tongue? His Jewish friends would have totally understood this. Because whenever the name of God was mentioned, a good Jew was to respond, blessed be he. Three times a day, the devout Jew had to repeat the Shemona Esra, the famous 18 prayers called the eulogies, and every one of them begins, blessed be thou, O God. Yet the same tongue, James says, that blesses God so freely, so too, so freely curses our neighbor. To James and to us, this is the unnatural consequence of sin. He says, look, how can a fountain spew out both good and bad water? How can a tree produce both good fruit and bad fruit? Uh, you don't get, you don't get uh, um, grapes from a tree. You, you don't get uh, 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 apples from a vine. You, you, it, it doesn't work that way. So how can the same mouth that blesses God curse those who are his greatest creation and those who are his children? I mean... <clears throat> Don't, don't curse my children and tell me you're my friend. Um, <clears throat> yes, my child may be unruly. Yes, my child may uh, be that child. But don't curse my child and then tell me you're my friend. Um, I, I don't need you to curse my child. That doesn't help me. I, I need you to 
love my child despite all of that stuff and and help me to be able to raise the child that's what parents need from church you know uh the old it takes a village thing folks we're the village we're the village um uh you know we have to be able to bless those who everyone else would curse we have to be able to love those so that no one else wants to love we have to be able to speak good of each other because there's so many others who are willing to tear us all apart john bunyan when he wrote pilgrim's progress has a character in there <laughs> I love the way he named his characters. As a character in there uh, named Talkative. Talkative is the name of the character. And Talkative is described as someone who is a saint abroad and a devil at home. Ooh. Ever know anybody like that? Oh, this person just bring shame on the name of Jesus because they speak with the voice of an angel on Sunday and swearing to peel the paint off the walls at home. Uh, saw a cartoon one time where uh, uh, obviously a family was coming in from, from church and the wife says to the husband, hey, no, I'm sorry, they're getting ready to go to church. The wife says to the husband, hey, how about if we do this? How about today you be nice at home like you are at church and then be as grouchy at church as you are here. <laughs> People who teach the wonderful stories of Scripture on Sunday and then tell stories that would make a bartender blush on Saturday night. Um, talkative, Bunyan says. A saint abroad and a devil at home. And do you see how that brings shame on the name of Jesus? Because by what we say, once we identify ourselves as a Christian, once we dare to put on that, that label, there's an implication that even the lost, even the pagans understand about how we are to hold ourselves to a higher standard than the rest of the world. If our goal is to look like the rest of the world, then they don't need church. They're fine just the way they are. If we're going to make an effort to be just like them, what we want to do is be able to flip that around and help them be like us. Um, and that's, that's, this, is, this is what James is getting at. You, you cannot, with the same mouth, bless God on the one side. And, and then act like you've never been saved on the other. The tongue can either build you up or tear you down. The tongue can either wound or heal. And James is saying that for a Christian, such a dichotomy should not even exist. We should not be tearing people down with one side and then building them up with the other. It is the very duty and the very nature of a disciple to speak every word as if God were the only audience. Because at the end of the day, he is the only audience. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing for us to remember. Um, we live in a culture that not only makes strangers of us, but now the culture says, you know, that's not good enough. Let's make enemies of, of everybody. Um, and at some point, the the, the, the followers of Jesus have to say, no, this person is not my enemy, simply because they voted for somebody else. They voted for the other guy in the last election. This person is not my enemy, simply because they're of a different ethnicity than I am. This person is not my enemy at all, because either they're my brother and sister in Christ, or... They're going to be, you know, I'm going to reach them for Jesus. The lost are nothing more than potential brothers and sisters. So either I can drive them away or I can pull them 
in. One of the best things in all these meetings that we put poor Dan White through, that he kept saying over and over, starting with the youth leadership team and everybody else, they said, so what's your goal with, with young adults? What's your goal with the, uh, with the teenagers? He said, create a community that the lost will want to be a part of. Wow. Create a community that the lost will want to be a part of. That's church, isn't it? It's called church. Yeah. Where they're accepted and not rejected, no matter what they look like. Um, again, for the umpteenth time until you buy the book, uh, one of the best books on evangelism uh, is entitled Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. Uh, written by a wonderful lady by the name of Rebecca Pippert, P-I-P-P-E-R-T, Rebecca Pippert, out of the salt shaker into the world. And she tells a story uh, about, I believe, a church in Oregon, Oregon, Washington, Northwest, um, back in the early 70s when those hippies first started appearing. And they were having church one day. And, you know, as, as Mike Warnke said, church, when I grew up, um, how religious you were was gauged on how much you, your face looked like you'd been sucking lemons. And, you know, you looked very stern, very pious mm, in church. Yeah. And this boy with, looked like he had just come off the, the stage of the rock musical hair. Uh, he's got on the, the leather vest with the fringe and the beads, uh, no shirt, uh, bell-bottom blue jeans with frayed at the end and, and no shoes, no socks, and didn't look like he'd had a bath in quite a while. And during the sermon, he walks all the way down to the front and then has the audacity to sit down right in front of the communion table with his legs crisscrossed, sitting there. And, and it so unnerved the preacher, he lost his place in his sermon notes. And the deacon chairman got up and everybody went, yes, go get him, Brother Bob. You know, and, and Brother Bob walked right down that aisle. They could all just see him snatching him up by all that hair, dragging him out. And probably for the first time in 40 years, Brother Bob sat down on the floor, on his bottom. They didn't, she didn't say in the story how long it took him to get back up. <laughs> Next to the hippie boy. And when the preacher collected himself and went on the sermon, at the end, as he sang the closing prayer at the end of the sermon, Bob puts his arm around the boy and says... I'm glad you're here. Those little words, I'm glad you're here, made all the difference in the world. Not only did that boy that day, but everybody else. Whereas if Brother Bob had said, get out, because you don't look like us, smell like us, it would have meant something entirely different, not only to that boy, but to everybody else. Kathy's twin brother, Keith, um, when the two of them were in college together, you know how she is. She gets him up on a Sunday and says, you're going to church with me. And so Keith, he'd lived with her all of his life. He'd already learned, you know, it's just easier to do what she says. So he gets up and he goes to church with her. And they go to a, a good church. Um, and... As they're standing at the door, the usher pushes past him, because clearly these are college students, and the usher says to him, step aside, Sonny, and let the paying customers in. It was 20 years before Keith ever went back to church. And a big reason why is that his sister married a preacher. But I didn't blame him. Because I don't know that I would have been a lot different if that would have been me. Folks, always stop and think about what even a casual word 
means to those around you. 2,000 years later, after James wrote all of that, we ain't learned nothing. We're not the brightest creatures in the world. That's why Jesus said you're all like sheep. Sheep are dumb animals. <laughs> you know, they're not the smartest animals in the world. They smell like the hippie, right? Yeah. So, all right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Lord, help us to be so mindful of the power of the spoken word, how it can be used for good or for evil. And Father, if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, then everything we say is a reflection on Christ. And so, Father, as Jesus says, let, let our yes be yes and our no be no. Let us always be honorable and honest in all that we say. And, Father, let us say it to build up and not tear down. Let us say it to love and not hate. Let us say it to give and not take away. And so thank